Well, it's an honor and pleasure to have you here again. Um, I wasn't going to start at the end of the film, but it's such a, a charming, ambiguous, sort of iconic, with that freeze frame at mm -hmm. the end, as the husband arrives. Um, it speaks to me about the way the whole film is this really delicate balance of tone and themes. And you almost kind of sum it all up, you know, in that final shot without sort of resolving it, mm -hmm. really, the tension. So beginning at the end, where did that where did that shot come from? Where did that ending come from? Well, it's not the ending that was in the script. <laughs> okay. Um, there was a whole scene, and it's actually Martin and, and um, Chris Guest arrive on his motorcycle, and there's a scene between the four of them, and it was just terrible. <laughs> it was just like an appalling scene. And... Um, I really didn't know what to do, and I just started looking at all the footage like it was a documentary. Mm -hmm. And I realized that the what happened in the beginning was that Anne leaves and she's bereft, and now Anne can go back to Martin. She's no longer bereft. She's created a life for herself. Mm -hmm. so I tried. What I tried to do was construct that situation um, out of outtakes. Like, we actually were drinking tequila, so everybody was pretty sugar. And <laughs> it was, and I, I told Fred and the sound person to keep, Fred Murphy, to keep rolling all the time. Mm -hmm. So all that stuff, like, oh, oh, Martin, it was just like between takes and ad-libbing and everybody kind of fucking around. Right, wow. And um, I was able to, c I didn't have enough of a shot of, of Susan looking down, so I just froze the frame. <laughs> <laughs> Art so emerges it from these. It's a completely constructed practical. ending. Right. But it, it felt right because it was the bookend to what had happened in the beginning. Well, it definitely feels right, and it definitely feels very natural. You mentioned um, you were sort of documentary, as sort of thinking right. about documentary shooting right. to construct this end. But so this film, to a certain extent, began as a documentary, or at least the grant funding was for a documentary right, at the that's time. Right. And you transitioned in the middle of that project into your feature fiction right. debut. How did, what was going on at that time? How did you make that jump, or why did you make that jump from documentary into fiction? I'd made, um, by now, I'd made like lots of documentaries. And um, the last one being the, the film in China with Shirley MacLaine and this delegation of American women, and I was, um, I just gotten to the point where I was sick of following people around with my camera, waiting for them to say basically what I wanted them to say, and then spending months in the editing room manipulating what they had said into what I thought would work. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't mean it quite that cynically, but it occurred to me that you could write the script first. Right? Yep. <laughs> and so, um, as opposed to at the end, which is what a documentary is. So I applied, well, when I applied for this grant, the first, the, for, from the AFI, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to make a documentary about growing up Jewish in America, which still interested me. I mean, it's sort of part of this film. But um, by the time I got the grant, I really was no longer interested in making a documentary. So um, with the $10,000, I spent 1000 of it to hire Vicky, mm -hmm. who's a girlfriend, to write this story about what happens between two young women when one gets married. And that was just the first third. It was three short films. And the second was based loosely based on Bliss by Catherine Mansfield, if anybody's read it. It's a young woman, an early marriage. And they've given a dinner party. And she sees her husband helping this beautiful woman on with her coat, and she realizes her husband's having an affair with that woman. That, and that's the story of Anne's marriage. And then the third s short was Cleo, the woman who he's having an affair with. So it was sort of Susan, Anne, Cleo. It was just this, it's sort of like three short stories. So with the $10,000 from the FI, or the 9,000 rest, we, we filmed the first part, which was 
goes through the red wall. And however, there's just seven minutes to the end of the red wall in the film right now. We actually shot like 40 minutes because I didn't understand you didn't need all that exposition. You didn't need to know how they met, how they became friends in college, you know. There's just much more extraneous stuff. Did I lose the track? Well, the transition to docu to, from documentary oh, to fiction. Right, right. But I wanted to, I mean, that scene where she's painting the red wall right. and we hear the, the audio from the marriage so many. Yeah. I mean, it's such an amazing uh, economy of narrative in that moment. I mean, there's a lot of other things to talk about before we drill well, down into the, the details. Uh, but you know, that's because I didn't have any money. Sure. I, <laughs> couldn't, sh I couldn't shoot a wedding. Right? I couldn't afford to shoot a wedding with a lot of people and stuff. So we took some stills of a real wedding. But there's also and then the red wall, it just, you know, I was just trying to figure out how to make the, the leaps. Well, the film is full of all of these really amazing little details. And like I said, there's a lot of bigger issues to get into before we burrow in, but I, I, we're here. So I love the scene in the cut from them in the bar where there's this sort of declaration of liberation. We right. don't need anybody to a laundromat. Right. Where they both have big life news. Mm -hmm. And they, the quick cuts of them hugging really sort of masks Susan's response to Anne's news in this really dynamic way. I also think about the sequence of her when Susan's alone in her room and she's sort of reenacting or enacti acting out the fantasy mm -hmm. ambitions that mm -hmm. she has. She is, um, you know, talking about shooting for Vogue, the mm -hmm. and then right. the power goes out. Right, And right. there's a whole number of little, little moments, mm -hmm. little details in that sequence. And then the final one that I thought was really striking to me was the little movements of objects around in the living room mm -hmm. or her kitchen that then become the explosion for the march down the long hallway to the desk where right. she's gonna change her life. Right. These little details, I wonder if those are connected at all to the kind of observational documentary style that you were uh, working at that time or how these things came about into the film. Right, that, that's very interesting because I, you know, um, coming up through documentary and, and being a, a camera woman, as well, I just, um, the kind of way people move away from each other when they mean, mean to be moving towards each other or they say things that are supposedly intimate, you know, the kind of, the way we sort of physicalize and the tininess, tiny gestures that give away what we really mean. And um, there's nothing like being, doing documentary to kind of really observe people. And, and understand, sort of be riveted by sort of what's going on underneath the surface. And I would go to movies and feel that I didn't really believe these two people were in this room having this conversation, or I didn't believe, I didn't believe the movies often. Mm -hmm. So I think I was kind of, um, documentary was kind of my film school. And, um, the film gets a little minimalist that way because it, you know, observes tiny gestures. But I think that the tiny gestures say a lot. Yeah, no, wonderfully minimalist. Well, speaking about the films you would go see where you didn't believe yeah. what the characters were saying or what they were doing, I wanted to talk maybe another uh, going broader. Was this film a response to what you weren't seeing in films in other ways? The, f the, 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 the relationship between two women, mm -hmm. a story focused on two women, um, and at the same time, where, because this film was so sort of like, you know, um, of its own kind at this, at this point. There were some, obviously, other films that were showing in the series being made around the same time, but it wasn't necessarily like a, a movement had been recognized yet or a, a happening had been recognized right. yet. So you were kind of, really on your own, mm -hmm. making up your own rules. So what were you responding to that you weren't seeing on the big screen, but also where were you getting your influences from? Where was the, your energy coming from to make this happen? That's a tough question. Um, I don't know. I, you know, I think everybody has the urge to, to tell their own story in, in, in some way. And um, it was, the. The film is is autobiographical emotionally, not necessarily each incident. You know, um, not necessarily each specific character or anything. But um, I think I just 
wanted to tell us, I, I wasn't, you know, I think I had really had blinders on. It was just, this was a story I wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know why I wanted to tell it. Um, I think I was interested in, there were very few female protagonists at this point in films. Um, and I, I was very interested in, in having a, um, a protagonist who was not the traditional protagonist. I guess it's, you know, self-defense or something. Um, you know, uh, can usually it's the pretty girl. It's I mean, like my grandmother, when she saw a cut of the film, she said, why did you follow the, that vulgar girl who speaks with her hands? <laughs> you know, why did you follow the blonde girl? And... Um, that's why I made the film. Right. You know, I mean, it's the it's the Rota lineage. Right. You know, it's the sidekick. It's the very funny girl or the kind of exotic, you know, not exotic ethnic, which in my day meant Jewish <laughs> um, or Mediterranean. Um, or it's the one who wants to be an artist who's trying to figure out what her life's about. You know, I don't, it was, I don't know. Well, there's a lot of really, I think, um, on the nose, very complicated relationship dynamics that Susan has with multiple characters mm -hmm. throughout the film, but obviously her relationship with Susan and Anne is obviously central. One of the things that's so striking about that relationship is the way it's this back and forth between a desire to support each other, but mm -hmm. also a kind of jealousy or a kind of anxiety that the other person is succeeding before or right. faster right. or getting what they want. And you really feel this like push and pull between them, not only in the, in the time they spend apart from each other, um, but when they're together, there's this real, where did, where did that dynamic emerge from? Or what, how do you feel like that is representative in some way, I'm curious. I think, well, the, the, there's, um, there's a, a book by Eleanor Bergstein who wrote, uh, the book is called Advancing Paul Newman. And the last sentence of the first chapter was, this is the story of two girls, each of whom suspected the other of a more passionate connection to life. And that kind of inspired the film, I think, you know, because I think we project on each other our uh, fantasies or our wishes of what, you know, mm -hmm. oh my God, she's married, she has this wonderful life, this husband who loves her, you know, oh my God, she's free. You right. know, she can do whatever she wants. You know, it's just, um, it's th these are complicated relationships right. in, in my experience. And, um, and uh, yeah, I was interested in exploring that. So the film, the budget, I understand, was like under one hundred and forty thousand dollars. I mean, one hundred and thirty-eight thousand dollars total. You shot it over four years, which is got to take a lot of energy to maintain yeah. everybody, to maintain yeah. the the tone the tone throughout, to maintain the you know all of the inspiration and energy. Mm -hmm. And then Warner Brothers buys it after it premieres at, you know, at, did it premiere at Locarno or did it premiere at? Um, first, it was at. Um, I had finished the film, but I didn't have enough money to get a print. Right. Um, or d and I really wanted to blow it up from 16 into 35, because otherwise I was afraid it would never get taken seriously as a film. Right. So I got this invitation from Rotterdam, the Rotterdam Film Festival, which is a really avant-garde film festival. And so I went to Erwin Young, who uh, was the president of Duart, a great man. I think he's no longer with us. and. I said, Erwin, I have no money, but is there any way that you would blow up the film for me? And then hopefully I'll be able to sell it and I can pay you back. And he said, sure. And he literally did the blow up for free. And so we, I got on the plane, the, as it came out of the lab, I got on the plane to Rotterdam, screened it, and people in the audience you have to understand, I've been working on this film for four years. It was like an albatross around my neck. I'd gotten an answering machine, one of the first answering machines, because I owed so many people so much money, I really couldn't answer the phone anymore. And <laughs> it was just really horrible. And, and w I, 
go straight off the plane into the screening at Rotterdam, um, people are laughing. And I can't, un I don't understand. I figure they don't really understand English <laughs> or something. And then afterwards, there's this article where it's, um, what is a commercial film doing like this at, at an avant-garde festival? Kind of an outraged review. <laughs> and, um, and I get a call from Cannes, from the Cannes Film Festival, okay. who then says, well, please come screen the film for us. So you know we're very interested in including it. And so Khan accepts it. And, um, and so then I go back to the States and I realize, well, now I have to sell it mm -hmm. or get distribution. And um, so I, I came to California as my first trip. I stayed in uh, the hotel that Eli Wallach t uh, told me to stay in, the Alta Caca, <laughs> <laughs> which is actually the Alta you know, on, off of Sunset, what's it called? I don't know if it still exists. Alta Loma or Alta something, huh? That was his nickname for the hotel. Right. <laughs> stay at the Alta Cock, I said. So, um, so I stay there and I'm literally looking up the phone numbers of the studios. I mean, I don't have a lawyer, I don't have an agent, I don't really know anybody out here. This Warner Brothers, I'm looking it up, MGM, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, that's what it stands for. You know, I'm looking this stuff up, and I call, and um, I really don't even know what to ask for. And so I said, uh, who's in charge? And then they say, <laughs> production or distribution? Uh, oh, good, distribution. And I get a, you know, I land up speaking with somebody who's in the lower level of distribution, and say, I have this feature film that I made, it's in 35 millimeter. It's just been accepted for the Cannes Film Festival. Here's a review from Rotterdam. <laughs> and um, okay, we'll screen it, you know, and there's some underling screens it and then they show it to their boss and they show it to their boss and within a few days, the head of the studio is calling. And, the, and it became like a bidding war. Wow, okay. I mean, it's not like, you know, um, and that's how I sold the film. That's great. I mean, were you at all, I mean, obviously you needed to sell the film, but were you mm -hmm. at all worried about bringing your independent baby into the, you know, or your creation into the God corporate no. studio world? Okay. No. <laughs> okay. No, no, I had to, you know, I owed too many people too much money. Right, right. And I, you know, I didn't have, um, we didn't have enough money to hire, I mean, actors even like at a SAG minimum, which I think was $500 a week mm -hmm. then. So I went to SAG and again, you know, made, said, look, what if we pay you half of SAG minimum and then w if I'm able to sell the film, we'll pay double, you know, right. twice as much as what they would have earned any in additionally, you know? And so I said, okay, that sounds good. I mean, nobody had, there weren't any independent features yet. I think right. in New York, it was like Cassavetes and he was shooting both places and it was, you know, it was very different. So um, everybody was kind of game and interested. Right. Just to take a chance and yeah. see what happened. Yeah, yeah. Well, the film, as I understand, got great reviews and was a big success when it first came out. Is that, I mean, it got, it played, it played well. I, but I wanted to sort of look at the last, I guess the last five years, the film mm -hmm. has really had a resurgence of yeah. interest. Lena Dunham, Greta Gerwig, mm -hmm. a number of, of this current generation of right. filmmakers has really started championing the film as an influence on them, or even people saying, wait, the work you're doing, Claudia Wilde done it, did in 1970, mm -hmm. you should watch this movie, and then making these connections. And so the film has been screening around over the last few years um, has, in a yeah. number of different places. How does that felt to you, this sort of inspiration to the next generation of filmmakers or maybe skipped a generation of filmmakers working yeah, today, feels, women it filmmakers. it feels great, it feels yeah. great. I mean, I'm always amazed that it still plays, you know, or that it still feels relevant. Or that it doesn't, I don't know, uh, how does it, maybe, I can't tell anymore, will I? Well, I think the film, and then I'll turn it over to the audience. Mm -hmm. um, we'll have mics on the aisle, so I'll call you and wait for the mic, we'll bring it over. But it's it's a very specific time and place, obviously yeah. in New York. Um, Wasn't Manhattan. New York beautiful? Yeah, it's the amazing. streets. 
Yeah, I know. I mean, the whole vibe the, of yeah. the way places and characters interact in the film is, a, is, a, is a, an amazing aspect of it. But it captures a very specific time and place um, in these characters' lives. But that is a, I think that's a moment that so many women go through. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just guessing, I'm, but you know, but I mean, but so that that moment and from keep going through between and keep going through and keep yeah going through. between school right. and establishing your career mm -hmm. and the doubt the anxiety the fear the excitement the elation mm -hmm. all of that stuff is so universal and timeless were you thinking about that when you were putting the film together at all no <laughs> okay I was just you know trying to do it yeah, yeah. <laughs> just tell my story you know it was just like. Well, it's, I mean, it's obviously yeah. a huge, I mean, it's having this huge influence and it's huge resurgence. So it's, I think it's, I think it's a classic. I mean, it's, it's a perennial. So, uh, questions from the audience. Question from the audience. Right, let's go over here on the side in the back. We're going to bring a mic back to you. Hi, uh, I loved your movie a lot. That was my Thank first time you. seeing it. All my friends uh, love it, and I just hadn't seen it, so I thought Thank this was you. a great opportunity. Um, I thought the casting was perfect. Every actor, like across the board, um, did you know who you wanted uh, to have in it, or ha what was the casting like? Um, you know, uh, except for Vivica Lynn Flores and Eli Wallach, everybody else read for the parts. And they, they were just young actors who came in and read. And um, it quickly became obvious, you know, who was right and who, th I, I mean, I was just very lucky that, that I was coming of age at the same time as Chris Guest and Bob Balaban and Melanie and Anita Skinner. With Eli, it was, um, I first wanted um, Paul Mazursky to play the rabbi. And, I knew him, and so he came in, and, and we read together. He came in like, and he, you know, he read, and I read Susan, and it was so embarrassing <laughs> that, um, and then I felt like, oh, I couldn't possibly direct him, and he was sort of busy because he was making an unmarried woman, right? And um, and then I thought about Eli Wallach, and and I had met him at at um, like an opening, an art opening. And he, we had had a nice conversation, and, and I was able to reach him and call him. And so I said, do you, you know, I'm making this little independent feature, and there's this part that you would be amazing. It's a rabbi who falls in love with a young woman who shoots weddings and bar mitzvahs for him. And he said, I'll do it. I haven't been offered a romantic lead in years. <laughs> he was just, he just didn't, you know, said, didn't say, yeah, I mean, it wasn't like, send me the script and we'll see, or blah, 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 you know. And I said, well, you can, ju you can, he said, you can just work it out with my agent, Biff Liff, which I thought was a joke, but there actually was an agent called Biff Liff at William Morris, and um, so I call up the agent, and, you know, we sort of, I said, well, you know, we're paying 50% minimum, bro, you know, he's shocked, and I said, so he says, well, what about billing, he says, and... I, uh, I said, well, you can bill me. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thinking, isn't that how it works? Because, I, I mean, that's how naive I, I genuinely was. And then he explained to me what billing was and, and so forth. But, and I don't remember how I got Vivica Lynn for but I just thought tonight she was so great. Wasn't she the gallery owner? Yeah. She was just great. And that was her son, Chris DeBorey who I wanted to imply she was having a, like an affair with. I mean, it's not her son in the movie, right? Yeah. Understood. Other question from the audience? Hey, over here in the, right here? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see the hand. I, there you go. I just wanted to ask, how old were you when you started making this film? I was probably 26 when I applied for the grants. It was my 30th birthday, the night that we shot that horrible scene with the four that I, for the end that I didn't use. And I finished it, I guess, when I was in my 
thirtieth year. Yeah, about yeah. We have a question in the woman in the back. Oh, you right there, behind the gentleman in the red sweater. Sorry. Oh. Hi, Claudia. Thank you for speaking. I screened this film a few years back here in LA with Melanie Mehron coming oh, to good. speak. And um, so it's my second time seeing the film, but I noticed so much more this time. Mm -hmm. And hearing you speak about where you were at in your career just resonates so much with my own experiences or lack thereof. And I'm curious how, from selling the film at Warner Brothers, your perspective on yourself and the career and how you addressed your next feature shifted as you entered the studio system as a director? Well, entering the studio system was an education in itself. You know, um, I was not especially tactical or political. I just knew how to say kind of what interested me or what I liked or what I didn't like. So. Um, I was not uh, educated for the dance that takes place in the studio system. Um, I, uh, Eleanor had written this wonderful script for It's My Turn, Eleanor Bergstein, who I was talking about, who also wrote, um, help me out somewhere. Is it Dirty Dancing? Dirty Dancing, dirty dancing. right, thank you. Um, afterwards, and you know, it was like a learning a whole nother Craft trying to trying to make a, a feature in the in, in well, it was really specific because uh, Ray Stark was the producer, and he was a really tricky dude. So, uh, you know, he did like to sort of mind fuck you, and um, I just did not know how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. So I kind of got on his wrong side. Um, I mean, what happened was that after he was very, you know, he thought this was really cute that he was going to have a woman director, and he, um, you know, it was time for me to hire a DP, and I didn't know any DP DPs except for Fred Murphy in New York, who was, you know, in Nabit. So I started screening a lot of movies to see who I would, you know, would make a good DP for this next film. And then he calls me in the screening room and he says, um, sweetheart, stop screening. I've hired you a DP. He's going to be perfect. And the one thing I knew is that I had the right to hire a DP. So I said, well, if you've actually hired a DP, then you can hire another director. And he was furious. Mm -hmm. You ungrateful girl. Do you have any idea what an opportunity I'm giving you? You know, it was like, yeah. It was just, you know, and, and, uh, and then he started calling me Barbara because he'd made a lot of movies with Barbara Streisand. <laughs> and then she had left him to make movies with somebody else. So um, it was a complicated relationship. But this was a different, <laughs> <coughs> this was a different, you know, this was a really a different era. You know, he would come on set and sort of run his hand down my back, said, oh, you're wearing a bra today. Well, yes. <laughs> That's, but you know, it's, I mentioned earlier. And so, I, I mean, I just imagine trying to make a film with those kind of obstacles. It's like, you know, you're. You were, you were quoted in, I mentioned an article that I mm -hmm. found in the New York Times in 1980, and it yeah. was probably came out just around the release of It's right. My Term, where you were quoted in the article um, as, I mean, basically saying that, I think the exact, well, not the exact quote, but paraphrasing a bit, was that you were also felt under uh, an extra level of scrutiny in the sense that, oh my gosh, she took five takes and the rumors would spread. She took five takes of this shot and all of a sudden there was this pressure, like five takes was too many. This was the same time as Michael Cimino was taking 179 takes, you know, <laughs> bringing down the studio, so. Right, and you do five takes and they're, mm. they're just as nervous. And, but it, I mean, you talk about a different era with the other thing though about mm. the article was it was talking about the dismal statistics of women behind the right, camera. Right. I think it was like 1% of all Hollywood films that year were directed by women. And I think we haven't really broken double digits yet. And no, it's like no, 40 it's years same. later. I mean, the same article could have been written today. Easily. Slightly updated statistics, right. and that's about it. 
Except maybe the sexism isn't so overt now. Maybe it's gone underground. It's I don't overt. know. I can't it's speak to it. It's less overt, I think. Because they know not to. Yeah, I mean, there are rules now. <laughs> right. But there are laws. But, um, but from, from It's My Turn, mm -hmm. you, 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 you've had a, a long, distinguished career as a theater director. You've done, a, a, I mean, just a ton of great t television. But I'm just curious, do you feel like you had the career that you wanted to have? And what, I mean, and to what extent do you think this, the nature of the studio mm -hmm. system was just, you, I mean, your relationship to it or the relationship you wanted to have mm -hmm. to it? Right. How did that sort of well, impact your decisions? I, you know, my, what's always interested me is telling stories. I really love, whether it was a documentary or a feature or a play or a television, like, t how do you tell the story? What's the story? How do you tell it? Um, I've just always been fascinated with stories. So for me to move from features into starting directing theater in New York, or Donald Margulies was a, a young playwright just starting out, and I brought his work to Joe Papp at the Public and started directing mm -hmm. there and at the Manhattan Theater Club, and it was like fabulous. It was amazing. It, it didn't feel like, oh, a lesser thing, right. you know? And then when I started doing television, it was television was just brilliant, and, and the, the needle has moved, you know, from movies being the the art form of the 21st century to really it's television now. So I never felt that because I didn't make more features that I didn't right. have uh, the career. I, you know, the I didn't have a real sense of a career. Right. Um, that being said, I'd really be interested in making a feature now. Right. But um, we'd love to see it. Yeah, I don't know that I have the energy or commitment at this point, or right. the you know the type A fuel that you need to do that anymore. Right. But did did your experience on It's My Turn suggest to you that Hollywood was not where you wanted to tell the stories because of all the other stuff you, you had to know, put up with? You know, I th I think it, it might have been possible to do some good work in Hollywood. I think that I had such a caricature, a, such an extreme caricature of a situation right. that. I, you know, I didn't see any reason to stay there and and try and do it again. Right. You know. Right. But I don't. Th that's not what every situation is like. It just right. was like, let me out of here. Right. Right. You know. Yeah. Another question from the audience. I think right here. Yeah. You're amazing and inspiring, and uh, I hope you feel all the love coming from this Thank audience. You. It's really extraordinary. Um, <laughs> can can you, you talk about the emergence of your directorial style as it's represented in this film, visually and in terms of working with actors? From, from what you're saying, you were kind of a neophyte when you started, and I'm mm -hmm. very interested to hear how you worked with this cast and how you developed the visual style of the film. Well. Fred and I worked, Fred Murphy, who shot the film, and I worked really closely together. Um, I had been a still photographer, weddings and bar mitzvahs. Um, I, um, I don't know how to describe the visual style. It was very limited by the equipment we had. You know, we had a 60 millimeter camera. We had four 1Ks. Those are Pretty simple lights. That was it. That was the package. And uh, once we rented a, a nine light, which is a sort of a big fluorescent, uh, well, I mean, uh, you can put day or, you know, tungsten or blue light in it. And um, basically it was, you know, it was to be as naturalistic as possible um, for you to feel that it's real, for you to feel that you're looking in on somebody's life. Um, this print, by the way, was super dark. It was like hard to see the film, and it was also kind of soft, I think. So I'm sorry, I apologize for that. It was like hard to watch. Us as well? Huh? Us as well. This print came from Warner Brothers. Right. So, yeah. And it, the colors popped around. Did you notice that? One shot would be pink, and the next shot would be yellow, and the next shot would be blue. It like it hadn't been timed or something. Color timed, I mean. But that, you asked me something else. Oh, about working with actors? 
Well, again, I was after, um, you know, I think the tone of the film is perfectly captured by Michael Small's score. Um, and which has a kind of humor to it and a kind of a sweetness, but also a kind of like, you don't have to take this too seriously. So that if she's sitting there crying, you can feel it, but you can also realize she's gonna be okay. You know, you don't have to despair. Right, for her, right? So um, that kind of humorous, that tone of kind of um, being engaged but also having distance was something that was real important to me. Um, in terms of, I work differently with all actors. I don't, you know, there's no one way of working. And um, I love working with actors. Um, they just give you so much. Um, like with the scenes between Chris and Melanie, like at the party and, and the scene when they're hanging the hammock when he comes in, both of those scenes were improvised. Because Chris was a great comic mind and Melanie would get on his wavelength and they could just riff. But other scenes I would never improvise. Or, you know, if it wasn't with somebody like him, I wouldn't consider that. Um, Bob Balaban, you just have to let him loose. <laughs> you know, he just is so real, but he, you know who that guy is. And you know he wants her life as much as she wants her life, you know? You understand what the problem is, even though you like him. I mean, I like him. Is that answering your question even remotely? It's Aside from the Mm -hmm. Taxi driver, yeah, who is grotesque and horrible. There are no real unlikable well, he, characters in the film. Everyone mm -hmm. is complicated, mm -hmm. makes bad decisions, makes good decisions. But everyone, you feel like you're always rooting for everybody right. in the film at some point. I mean, is that sort of a? That's real important to me. Yeah, yeah. you don't want any easy, um, easy. I mean, even the taxi driver, you know. Obviously, he's had the mumps, and he's got a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's a serious problem. <laughs> you know, yes. and he's he, and he's looking for help, not in a way that's a particularly attractive, and you know, but but nevertheless, I didn't, didn't you know, I mean, I, you, what was it? You know, you always have to look for somebody's perfect. Everybody has their own perfectly good reasons for what they're doing, and you have to find them. I think as opposed to just demonize them for what they're doing. I mean, that's what makes, that's the fun of it, I think. It's harder to do it in life. Did you have, oh, I'm sorry, your question in the back, very back. I hope you don't mind a trivial question, but Please. what was with the um, neck braces? Oh, yeah, I wanted to imply they were having an affair. So they've gotten in an accident together. They've gotten in an accident together. I just thought neck braces would be good. Yeah. Huh? You got it? Good, see? I mean, as, as I kept filming, I realized you didn't need a whole lot of exposition. Right? You just needed something. Other questions from the audience? Oh, uh, right here on the aisle. Uh, you mentioned uh, you know, Chimino in comparison to the heat that you were getting. Mm -hmm. If he hadn't completely uh, screwed the pooch, do you think that there, there would have been a longer run of personal driven films like yours at the studios? Uh, or was it, go if, if, if it hadn't crashed and burned with him, was it still kind of going to fade out anyway? Uh, I have no idea. I don't have a good sense of film history and, you know, what the rest of the industry was like at that time. Well, just from your Yeah. Hmm. I really don't think I can answer because um, 
why did the personal films fade out? Do you, do you think it was because of Jimino? Well, certainly I think in, when the, for the studio interests, I mean, in the 70s, right. late 60s, 70s, they were looking for new voices, mm -hmm. looking to reach new audiences, and I think that that definitely had an impact on mm -hmm. their willingness to take a chance on a quote-unquote auteur right. Right. and uh, a visionary, but, you know, it's one factor among many, I think, that yeah. affected so many of the women directors working at this period as well. You just have to, you can't, you know, to take that into mm -hmm. account. I'm curious about, since we're talking about auteurs, one of the quotes that gets brought up a lot with girlfriends is Stanley Kubrick's comment about it. And mm -hmm. basically, if I understand the context, was I think it was a Playboy interview. They asked him to talk about Coppola or Scorsese or any of the big auteurs who were emerging mm -hmm. at that time. And he chose to talk about girlfriends. Mm -hmm. And he said that he thought it was basically the most the only American film that could stand up, that he'd seen, that could stand up to the European uh, auteurs and the, uh, the new wave and, mm -hmm. the, and the sort of sophisticated dramas that were coming out of, art house films that were coming out of Europe at the time. Mm -hmm. I wonder, when did you first hear that quote and how did you respond, how, what was your feeling about it? Um, I saw it in a bookstore, in a book on Kubrick. And it was there, and I like, couldn't believe it. Yeah. And this was well after the film I had, had come children out, by then. I don't okay, know. Okay. It must have been like after 86, you know. <laughs> okay. That quote now seems to include it in almost every I retrospective know. I know. comment about the film. It's pretty yeah. amazing. So. It is amazing. He, he's, actually, it's true. If, if, if there were any influences on me, it was, you know, French films and... Italian films, yeah. English films. Well, I mean, I think he's, I mean, I'm not going to contradict Kubrick. I think it's just, I think he's absolutely correct. I mm -hmm. mean, it, is, it has a very European vibe to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, although it's very specifically American. Any other questions? Let's go right down here again. Yeah, the mic will come from behind you. Sorry. Speaking towards this, uh, the demise of the personal film, mm -hmm. uh, and specifically within this film, the the poem about the war with my mother. That beautiful um, poem, Honor More. So what was your feeling about that, that poem at the time you included it in the film? Well, I thought it worked well for the character, for Anne. Um, I loved the poem. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the notion of colonizing Venus. Um, and you know, it's it's always a hard thing. You have a, a character as a poet and a character as a photographer who need to find their work somehow, work that feels like it might be coming out of them. And um, I just thought, you know, Honor was kind enough to let me use that. And there was another poem. That, I mean, there was other scenes of Anne reading poetry that are no longer in the film, but. Um, I just thought it was a beautiful poem, and it was, you'd believe that Anne might have written it. It's also a scene that sort of points to the complexity of having a friend, when two, mm -hmm. two artists who right. are friends, and how they've, you know, look to each other for feedback. But right, they and, don't, and aren't always able to support each other. You yeah. know, it's important to be honest, and but you don't know, you know, and sort of impose yourself on each other and just when she's running to work and she can't really listen and yeah. she's actually, you know, on the can and <laughs> late. Yeah, the challenges of, of two people living together, creatives. Oh, let's go right here in the middle. Right here, the gentleman in the middle of the audience. You can, just, can you pass the mic down to the gentleman in the middle, please? Thank you. When I heard you uh, characterize the Michael Small score having uh, this balance of pathos and comedy and warmth and lightness, it made me think of Melanie's performance. It was just extraordinary that it had those colors just braided throughout. And I had the uh, um, occasion of seeing Car Wash, which was a couple years before this. And I remember It was right in the middle. Oh, okay. So, right, because your film yeah. took so long yeah, to make. Yeah, we, so we shot the first part, then she did Car Wash. 
And she also did the Mazursky film, Harry and Tonto, is that the one? I don't remember her performance in that. Yeah, but I, so I she just did saw a few films and then came back and we shot some more. So Car Wash had that same, her character had all this pathos, but yet she was very comic. Yes, and she, she great couldn't quality. be beaten down by the sadness. Mm -hmm. And it was a very tiny part. But what I wanted to ask you is, were you aware that you were getting that oh, yeah. richness and depth as you were yeah. making this film? Yeah, we did over a lot of auditions, years? a lot of reading, and that's what was so amazing about her is that she, she was limpid. You could feel the emotion just coming off her, but at the same time, she had that sense of humor um, that would deflect. Uh, yeah, it, that's that's why I cast her. It was just, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> so we have one more question from the audience, right here. I, I just have two quick questions. One is, where was her apartment building, the exterior shot? Oh, it was. Um, Right next to Ethical Culture, I think 64th Street between Broadway and Central Park yeah. West. Yeah. And the other one is, who, wh what was the inspiration for the hitchhiker character? Oh, Seal. Um, you know, on a spectrum. Uh, and next to Susan seems freer, but seal on the spectrum is further out. Um, I also wanted to, you know, um, deal with homosexuality, with that, the flirtation with it, the possibility of it. And yeah, it. There is that interesting shot at the party where she comes down the hall mm -hmm. and, and the turns, and there's two women are, kissing, two women are yeah. kissing, and right. I mean, I thought that was a really interesting detail too, and particularly in context of, mm -hmm. of um, Cecily's Cecily character, right? Cecily's character. So, yeah. Yeah, it was just another thing I wanted to explore. You know, not to feel obligated to have a homosexual relationship to if you didn't feel it. I mean, just to be who, for her to be who she was and for it to be no big deal. I mean, particularly as the film is, to a certain extent, about finding oneself, finding one's right. identity. I mean, right. there's a certain unmooring that she goes through when Anne leaves. She sort of, on her own, wants to be on her own, experience that, but then she kind of becomes unmoored in a certain way. Yeah, she's right. kind of devastated. Right. I mean, uh, similarly speaking, uh, and then we've got to wrap up, so I don't mm -hmm. mean to take the last question. If anyone's got a question to raise, um, her relationship with the rabbi mm -hmm. and Eli Wallach, where did that emerge from in the, the, the script writing process? Mm -hmm. and, and how did that, you know, what did that help you say about her character? Well, that she was very, you know, um, I think, you know, there's something very attractive about an older man mm -hmm. who can kind of see you and uh, is riveted by you, is fascinated by you, can see your struggles and and um, in, in a way that, I, I, I don't know, it just seemed like a, uh, it was autobiographical, what can I tell you? But it did allow us to, I mean, that story also did yeah. allow us to, allow you mm -hmm. to bring another woman into yes, the story, I his wife. And in that one scene, you wasn't get. Wasn't she stunning? Tanya Barrison, she just yeah. passed away last month. Oh. She's a brilliant actress. In that one scene, it's practically my favorite performance, that moment where she comes through. Have you ever seen a football game? Keep it that way. <laughs> I mean, there's a whole history in that one line. I mean, their whole relationship <laughs> unfolds. Yeah. It's just great, and it's not necessarily, maybe she's suspicious, maybe she's not, whatever. You know, I just, she was great. Well, Claudia, it's a real honor for us to have you here, so thank you very much for thank coming. Thank you. It's an amazing film. Thank you very much.